Hello, friends. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Anti-Monopoly Happy Hour. I'm your host, Ron Knox, Senior Researcher at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, your friendly neighborhood monopoly crusher. Yeah, did that thing once again this week. It is an absolute pleasure to have you with us. However, you're consuming the happy hour, watching live on Twitch, watching on YouTube, watching however, wherever you might be. It's very, very nice to have you here. Nice to be here with you. It's also very, very nice to be joined by our, our, our co-host for the evening. Second week in a row. Huh? How about that? you love to see it. ILSR's own Katie Keenbaum. Katie, what's up, friend? Hey, I think if you're a Monopoly crusher, I'm more of like a Monopoly bender. I'm like a little softer. <laughs> just, just crinkle it up a little bit. I don't know why we're so mean to Monopolies. Like Monopoly caresser. Monopoly tickler? No. Monopoly. Just give it a nice head sure. pat and send it it's on its way. I'm sorry to bother you, friends. No! Not one escapes! <laughs> All right. Very nice to have you here. We got a big show. Large, large size show. Oh, the date? It's Thursday, July 1, 2021. There we go. Got to get that out of the way. Uh, we have a big show for you. It's another, I mean, again, another busy week. I feel like the uh, anti-monopoly world is like, it's just like a foot on the accelerator and it just goes down and down and down. And there's bigger, faster and faster and more news is like blasting us. So we got a lot to get to. Uh, we'll talk about a judge handing, the, handing, dealing the Federal Trade Commission an L, a medium-sized L, not a big L, uh, in, its, uh, in its monopoly complaint against Facebook. And then we'll talk about how Amazon, big bad Amazon, is afraid, shaking in their boots, of Lena Khan, new head of the Federal Trade Commission, number one trust buster in America. Bunch of cowards over there at Amazon. We'll talk about that. And we will be joined by our guest of the week, our very, very special guest. She's the head of Athena, which is a coalition to fight Amazon, break its monopoly power, We'll be joined by Daniel Rajendra, who's the big homie. Let's do it. Let's talk about, uh, oh, oh, time for the beer of the week. Beer of the week. Today, what am I drinking? I've never had this beer before in my life. I'm very excited to try it. This is, again, local yokel. Not only do I do like uh, independent small, I like small breweries, but I also like locals. And this one is from the Ozarks here in scenic Missouri. You love to see it. Uh, Big Piney River IPA. Piney River Brewing Company. It is holy shit, bro. It is 8%. Woo! Look out. Look out. Cross-eyed by the end of the show here. Uh, and here is. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Right there. That symbol tells you, beer enjoyer, that your beer is brewed by uh, Grandma. A night in a cabin in the Ozarks of Missouri. No, brewed by a small company, maybe a medium-sized company, but certainly not some big, nasty, predatory beer monopolist like Budweiser, Miller, and so on. So that's what I'm drinking. Cheers, Katie, what you got? Well, first I have to ask you, are the Ozarks also in Arkansas or am I just stupid? Ooh, <laughs> what, is. Where, where is there? Jesus, tastes like wine. Boy, this is, this is a stiff one. Hmm. <laughs> the Ozark, I mean, the like Ozark Mountains kind of go south into, into Arkansas. But like most people really think of as the Ozarks and that is like dead ass middle of Missouri, like middle south bit of Missouri. Well, apparently I think of Arkansas, so. <laughs> That's okay. Hey. Debatable. <laughs> it's all, it's all the same hills. Scenic, We're... leafy hills, you know. Perfect. Um, so I have, uh, I actually have a, a craft soda um, for a nice, relaxed Thursday. <laughs> um, it's from, it is from Spring Grove, Minnesota. So, um, you know, it's, I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota, so it's, it's close by. Um, 
can kind of see it. it says it's from there. So that's all. I don't have a doodad, but that's okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's local enough, I think. Um, it's, and it's not small big enough, soda, right? It's not big soda. No, it's like a little family owned thing. It's been around for over a hundred years, according to the bottle. So dang, yeah. Well, mazel tov, mazel tov. And congrats on your soda. I have, this is my weekend. This is the start of my weekend. So my 8% beer is going, going hand in hand with that, with that, uh, that state of affairs. What's up, Britt? The homie Britt in the chat. I'm not going to get hammered tonight. I'm good. I'm just going to keep it. I'm going to keep it easy. All right. Let's talk some news, friends. A federal judge overseeing the Federal Trade Commission's monopoly case against Facebook this week said, you're out of here. Toss the FTC's complaint and the, the 48 state attorneys general who also sued Facebook over its monopoly crimes, uh, monopoly uh, abuses. There we go. Better word. Threw out their complaints. A big this is so the FTC sued Facebook for monopolizing illegally monopolizing the social media industry for 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 I'll have to remember the exact name of the of the market that they define personal social media services or something right around there per, right personal social networking personal social networking exactly so so. So what that market is, is like this networked um, kind of collection of your friends and your family. And you and and as 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 the government said in the lawsuit, uh, you more than likely, far more than likely rely on Facebook and Facebook's adjacent properties to connect with your friends and family online in this kind of social network. Okay. And so, and so the government said, okay, here's what happened. So, so Facebook rose from, you know, uh, Zuckerberg's fucking dorm room or whatever, you know, the, you know, the, the origin story of this. I've seen the movie. Mm -hmm, exactly. And now, and since, since 2011 is the date that's in the lawsuit. Since 2011, Facebook has monopolized, has, 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 had a, has had a dominant share, market share, kind of a term of art, um, of, this, of this industry, this like personal social network industry. And it illegally tried to maintain that monopoly power by buying out its rivals rather than competing, you know, toe to toe in the marketplace. Rivals being Instagram and being WhatsApp. So it buys them up. And then there's also some allegations in the lawsuit about Facebook kind of like cutting off various kinds of um, interoperability and access to, to third parties and so on. That's the allegation in the lawsuit. And the lawsuit is a big deal because the government says, look, one of the things we're looking to do here one of the real solutions to this is that we're going to break this company up and we're going to make it spin off these things that it acquired illegally, right? Instagram, WhatsApp. We're going to make it spin those off into their own separate companies. They'll all be separate again and competition will be restored and the end. That's, that's the big plan. And so this, I want to, I want to be clear about what has happened here. The judge did not throw out the case. The judge throws out the case, then it's over, close the book, that's it. You're all done. The judge didn't throw out the case. The case is brand new, by the way. This is literally, this is the very first step in like any federal lawsuit. The plaintiff, that's like the government, or maybe it's a private party or whatever, sues. Another, another company or whatever group of companies, if it's a class action or whatever, or if it's like a, you know, group. And, and, and the very first thing that happens is the defendant who is being sued says, 
you know, let's throw this out. And they file a motion to dismiss. Fair, first step. Like the first inning of a nine inning baseball game. That's the first thing that happens. And it's never supposed, it's not supposed to be, unless, unless the lawsuit is a clear like sham. Unless it's nonsense. It's that, that step is never meant to be the end of the road for a lawsuit. It's just supposed to weed out the really bad stuff, right? And yet, what happened this week is that a judge said, uh, you know what? Facebook's right. Let's get this out of here. This is, this is done. But it said, look, if you want to, if you want to come back, you can come back. But as of right now, I'm throwing this complaint out. The case is open, but I'm throwing the complaint out and it's done. Can you, can you clarify for me? Did it, for some reason, I thought, um, that the FTC's filing is still open, but the the state attorney general can't. I don't but, know. Okay, yes. yeah, that's what I thought. No, thank yeah, you. Okay. Good. That's a super good point. The judge did tell the states, "You're done." But that's more of a. Was that more of a jurisdiction? It was because issue? of the, it was because of the timeliness. Okay. It was a timeliness thing. So the states are done. But the FTC's complaint is still around. And I want to and I want to I want to kind of explain a little bit what happened because it's because it speaks to exactly why our system of enforcing the law against corporate power and monopoly power is completely broken. And it's and it's also I and I want to I, I want to say you just take my word for it here that the judge was completely wrong. And it was a bad decision. Let's With your uh, your long long legal history, hey, lots I, of uh, degrees I'm and <laughs> bro, many degrees. Ninety eight point six is one of them. No, but really, I, I really think it's a bad law. I, I think it's a bad a bad decision by the judge, and I want to talk about it. Let's. I'm going to go to a screen share. All right. So here's the decision. It's just words. You're looking at you're looking at you know black words on a white page. Okay. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. And I won't, I won't go too far into it, but. But so what this says is. It says. If this case involved a typical what it calls a typical goods market, like selling a thing, selling books, whatever. Then maybe the court could say, Okay, these FTC allegations that that Facebook has a monopoly, has monopoly power. Maybe the court could like wrap its mind around what that meant. Because, you know, whatever. You're a company that sells things, you control, you own a certain percentage of the overall sales in America of that thing. Right? If you're General Mills, you sell some percentage of all of the cereal sold in America. I don't know what that percentage is, but you can figure that out. You can look at the sales, figure that out. But the judge says, look, because we've defined this market as personal social networks, whatever, that's, that's, that's it. That's the, that's the language. They don't know what to do. with The, the judge didn't know what to do with it. So when the government alleged, which it, which it said in the lawsuit, that Facebook controls 60% or more of this market, and it has for a long time, since 2011, decade, and that no one even, no one else comes close. It's by a, a absolute mile the, um, the dominant social network in, you know, in America and around the world, but in America. But it doesn't sell anything. The court says, I don't know what to do with that. The court is, I'm, now I'm reading. The court is thus unable to understand exactly what the agency's 60% plus figure is even referring to, let alone able to infer the underlying facts that might 
substantiated. So what the court said, what the judge said, is that it believe it, you know, it said, okay, we believe the government's market. We believe there is this market for for personal social networks. Okay, fine. And they don't, and they didn't believe any of any of Facebook's arguments to the contrary at all. And in fact, was pretty aggressive in throwing those out in this in this. Uh, in this opinion, in this order, I should say, in this order. But it said, just saying 60% isn't enough. And to be fair, the government didn't say much more than that. I, I, read, I read the lawsuit again just to double check. But that's not the point. Well, it's kind of like in like a math class or something. You get the right answer, but you fail to show your work. Um, and that's not consider good enough even if like clearly you got the answer you figured it out somehow uh presumably unless you guessed extremely well you know what you're doing but right right exactly you just didn't show your work okay that's that's what's happening here and that's this that is that's this issue in like in a bubble but there's but but it's not actually being it's not it's not supposed to happen this way. It's not supposed to happen this way. Oh my God. Okay. And then, so first, before I, before I, I'll say more, but look at these stories. So you see all over the internet, the FTC screwed this up. And I put a story up from Fortune and Fortune's website is like an absolute maze of ads and video and whatever. So I'm not going to stay on this for too long. The FTC fumbles its big antitrust case against Facebook. Fumbles. Let me explain two things that just make me insane about this. First of all, this is not, this is not the moment in this case or any case like this where this issue should be decided. It's just not the place. You have an entire ass trial pre-trial a whole series of things are going to happen before you actually get into even the trial part of it you're going to have the most you're going to have a ton of discovery you're going to have all these other steps along the way to even get to the part where you're in trial and the trial is going to take weeks weeks and weeks this is the biggest antitrust case in the history of america This is not the point where the government should have to prove the details of its factual allegations contained in the complaint against Facebook. That's not the point where this is supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen way down the road. You'll get, everybody will get to argue about that 60% number or whatever it is. Everybody will get to argue about that. The government, you know, Facebook, economists, like, literally everybody else which by the way it's exactly why our antitrust system is so incredibly broken because that question is going to get decided by paid like expert like economists who are there to most of whom are there to like literally defend monopoly power no matter what but even so even with even in that broken system this isn't the time to do that. <laughs> this is just the start. And the judge and the judge throws it out. I mean, that's part of like, I mean, that's that's what you get <laughs> when you have, uh, you know, you're something like a Facebook or an Amazon. You you get the benefit of the doubt. You, uh, you have to people have to cross a higher burden, um, you know, to to move forward with the you know, sue me. You know, that would that would <laughs> you would need very limited evidence to be able to move forward with that. Absolutely. I don't have, you know, there's um, a lot more caution, um, you know, even, you know, on regulators, like every, every, every other entity treats, um, you know, these, these big companies with a lot more caution than any other, any other person or company and, and, you know, the country um, gets yep. the benefit of. Yep. Look, absolutely. And not, not just, this isn't just like, this isn't just like, you know, Facebook, and Amazon tilting this like system in their favor. This is like a generation, very powerful company. 
the law in their favor so that now this is where we, are, where, where we have judges throwing out a case one step out of the gate when that was never intended. That was never supposed to be the plan because of how case law has been built up. And so this case, and so, uh, okay, hold on. I'm going to, 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 I'm just, I'm just show you something. Here's some stats. Here are some statistics. And this is just based on the number of visits by users. If you just go by the number of social media site visits from, in America, here's Facebook's market share up on the screen. 72%. The next closest is Pinterest, which there, there's no way that Pinterest lives inside of this market definition. It doesn't, right? At 12%. Then Twitter at 9%. Also, Twitter probably does not live inside this market definition because people go on Twitter to fucking argue with strangers instead of like see pictures of their nieces and nephews. And then the next, and then the next biggest is Instagram. <laughs> Bro, this is one company. It took me two seconds to Google this. Facebook's size and outsized market power is dead ass obvious. To anybody who wants to, who wants to, to be even remotely curious about it. All right. So that's well, why I hope. Uh, I hope they, um, uh, the FTC just amends its filing with uh, a printout of Google results. I think, <laughs> literally. I mean, I hope they admit, yes. I, I, okay, so, what, okay, so, like, you know, so what's the next step? So I think there are two next steps. One, I think the FTC is going to amend its filing. I think, Katie, you're right. That's what's going to happen with literal basic, like, according to user, number of users, according to visits, according to revenue. I mean, whatever. Pick a metric by which you're going to measure Facebook's power in the market. What's up, Colin Parson? Thanks for the follow. And you amend the complaint to say that. And then hopefully that's like satisfactory, although you never know. But then the second thing that has to happen is that Congress has to change these laws. They have to change these laws. Because this bad jurisprudence is built up over, over decades. Where now, a thing that is obvious to the naked eye, Facebook's power in the social media market. 2.7 billion users, bro. No one's close to that. That power that everyone can see and know, inherently know, uh, becomes a point of contention in the very first stage of an antitrust case. You've got to change this law. You got to change the law. You got to get rid of this stuff. Do you think, uh, so, you know, there's, there's obviously, um, the, like you can create new case law by running cases, but do you think there's, this would be a long game, obviously, and only part of the puzzle, but is there, is there like, I don't know, I hope isn't the right word, but would there be a strategy of like trying to get you know, a different kind of, you know, generation of judges, um, you know, um, on, you know, on the bench. Um, so, you know, they're kind of, you know, they have to work from case law, but yeah, you know, I think there's, you know, you can always create new, new case law so they can, you know, is that even something anyone's talking about or, you know, is that just kind of like, we change the laws, we, we uh, bring good cases, we'll, we'll be able to, you know, it doesn't matter who's, who's deciding this necessarily. I think, I think it's part of it. I think that's part of it. But you got to, but like, a thing that I want to point out is that that was the strategy of the pro-corporate, pro-monopoly law and economics movement. They got a bunch of new young judges appointed to the bench over the course of the last... 40 years from both Republicans and Democrats, by the way, as we saw, by the way, this was an Obama appointee judge who, who made this ruling, right? 
But the law and economics people, they invited all these new judges. They're like, oh, come, we'll teach you. We'll, we'll get you. We'll get you straight on antitrust law and how it's supposed to work and what its goals are. And how to adjudicate it. Well, don't worry. We know you're just like generalist judges. You were like a lawyer five minutes ago and now you're someone's judge. So come on, we'll teach you. So I think focusing on the judges is. Um, it's a it's a strategy I don't like, not only because the other side has done it with some success. But because I think it it's it's like a band aid on the problem, and I think he fixing the problem means fixing the law. But do you think I mean, you don't think that like. I guess that that's part of why I ask, because that has been such a strategy for, you know, different different causes um, generally, um, you know, more pro corporate causes or more conservative causes. Like, can, can we you know, are, are we going to have as much success if there isn't that also that intention to make sure that, you know, it's not fighting an uphill battle once it gets to the courts? Um, you know, I don't think that obviously wouldn't be the only, only thing. Um, but I just, I feel like no one really talks about that piece of it. And I, yeah, I, is that necessary? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe if you write a good law, you can't get around it. Right. I think that's smart. I mean, I like what you're saying. I like where your head is at. Cause we're thinking, we're thinking about like multi-pronged strategy. Like how do you take on corporate power in all these various ways? Maybe you write the law, you definitely appoint what, well, you know, good judges. Right. And then maybe, and then maybe, uh, you know, anti-monopoly folks should, you know, embark on the same on the same tactics and strategies that the law and economics folks have used to 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 great effect for the last 30, 40 years. Maybe it takes all these things. But right now, but that, but as you said, that's a long term strategy, right? Right now, the power is in Congress's hands. It's right there. So I think that should be the focus. And I think the FTC should replead its case. And I think the ruling was wrong in the first place. The end. Well, maybe if there was a, a different uh, judge, it would have ended up differently. I love this. Just got a good time machine. I love this. You got to write an essay about this, bro. This is. Oh, no, no, absolutely not. That was, <laughs> this is, that, that's all I've got. I've got those six sentences. <laughs> Nothing else. You got to send a tweet about brain this. is empty. You got to send again. a tweet about this, Katie. You gotta send I'll a tweet start a this. Twitter account just to tweet that. <laughs> More Close news. it down. Be like, this is my one thought. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Good. Close repeatedly it. Tweet Shut it. it down after that. Shut it down. I got my thought out. Oh my God. News. More news. <laughs> Who is afraid of big bad Lena Khan? I'll tell you who's afraid. I'll tell you who's afraid. Only one of the most, the most powerful, wealthiest, far reachingest monopolists on planet Earth. Amazon is afraid of big, bad Lena Khan. Amazon this week uh, petitioned, petitioned the Federal Trade Commission to force Lena Khan our trust busting friend who is now the chair of the federal trade commission to recuse the show <laughs> to recuse doesn't her. know it yet. <laughs> so the friend of the show. That's right. That's right. That's right. She'll come on. She'll come hang out. I'm sure. I'm not sure of that. Um, uh, so Amazon petitioned the FTC to get Lena Khan to recuse herself from any future Amazon related antitrust action. Why? Why would Amazon worry so much about big bad Lena Khan? Because, as it turns out, Lena Khan has studied Amazon. Oh, wrote and published uh, the most important, influential academic paper on monopoly power in the last half century called Amazon's Antitrust Paradox. And in that paper, this is when she was, by the way, when she was a law school student at Yale in 2017, published this paper 
detailing 150 pages or however long this paper was. I'm, I'm making that up, but it was a big one. Yeah, you got to scroll a lot if you're reading you gotta, it online. You, you really got to scroll. If you print it out, you're going to have to change your paper in the middle of that print because you don't have enough in your printer, for sure. The paper detailed Amazon's myriad wrongdoings, anti-competitive behavior, including most notably uh, a textbook a textbook definition case of predatory pricing, which is where a monopolist or like a company with some market power, as they say, dominant company, lowers the price of a thing below the cost to make it or to or for them to acquire it. With that below cost pricing forces a rival company or multiple rival companies like out of the market one way or the other by hook or by crook, either because they went out of business or because they, they capitulated and, and agreed to a merger or whatever. And then that monopolist raises the price of that good up to monopoly levels after all of its rivals are forced out of the market. That's predatory pricing. That's what Lena Khan's paper said. And otherwise, Lena Khan has been just a brilliant, well-studied, and well-spoken critic of big tech, of Amazon, of corporate power in general. Her whole and career. of the, 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 like, you know, framing of Monopoly over, you know, the past few decades, right? I mean, just how, how it's, yeah. I mean, she literally changed like, the Like, argue, yeah, that, that's what I, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a big part of, I think, uh, you know, what she's bringing to the table here, too. I mean, she changed the conversation. She changed the conversation about monopoly power in America. And, and these aren't, these aren't, like, opinion. She's not a columnist, you know what I mean? She's not a talking head, Right? She's a scholar. She's literally looking at the history, at the conduct, at the facts. She's an investigative reporter, right? She's gathering all the facts, all the stories, all the background. And then she's told the story of how monopolists, certainly including Amazon, have hurt small businesses, workers, communities, the economy overall. That's what she's done. And that's why, literally why, she was chosen to lead the FTC. And so Amazon says, we can't have that. This is from the New York Times. Amazon demanded on Wednesday that Lena Khan, the new chair of the Federal Trade Commission, and an avowed critic of the company recuse herself from any antitrust investigation into the e-commerce giant. Is there any precedent for this? Um, you there, know, obviously there, you know, people recuse themselves when it, they, you know, maybe it's a company they formerly worked for, or they, you know, have family members that work for it, that kind of thing. That makes sense. Um, is there anything kind of in the same vein of this person has spoken publicly about <laughs> their uh, like a legal opinion on uh, you know matters concerning this, um, so therefore they can't. Um, we will we request that they not uh, participate in these cases. Only the other way around, from what I from from what I know. Now I don't know everything. Maybe there was an instance of this happening uh, at some point in the past uh, of, of 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 the commission. But the only recusals that I've ever seen or heard about or whatever from 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 either of the antitrust agencies are because of what you just described, because of like a conflict, basically a conflict where like the um, the, you know, the ex lawyer who like waltz through the revolving door into, into this agent, into the government agency is now faced with an investigation of a company that it like literally just 
worked for or consulted for or did legal work for or did economics work for. So then they have to recuse themselves. Yeah, that's I mean, the, like, that's the most common, right? I, I don't know. I just like the, the 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 former head of the FCC used to work for. I mean, this is the, the FCC too to enunciate, so folks know I'm talking about um, Federal Communications uh, Commission, but worked for you know Verizon, <laughs> like, and still like was very involved in policy that you know impacts Verizon. Um, so I don't know. It just I mean, obviously it's bananas, but <laughs> just to to be clear, it's bananas. It is. And it's colla- And by the way, from a company like Amazon. Amazon that is like all about. It's all I mean, it, it, it does everything it can to like show off its. Remarkable power, right? It brags about the stuff. It's a we, we, Amazon, are small businesses saviors. We are the only reason you can get a package on your door in a day. We're the only reason, you know, we are now, we're the biggest, the biggest private employer in America. We are a job creator. We're an innovator. We're, Amazon's like, no, Amazon is just a big swinging dick. You know what I mean? Put that on their boxes. And, and uh, bro, put that on their put that on your smiley face. That's what is on the box. <laughs> <laughs> it's just abstract, you know. It is. To avoid some parental is, um... concerns. <laughs> Not that abstract. <laughs> Everyone notices. Everyone notices. But Amazon wants to be this company. And then do this absolute clownish incredibly weak looking behavior where it asked this one person that this one person, this one federal agency, because they were, because, because they were so mean. Lena Khan was so mean to poor Amazon. And now Amazon wants her to step away from the FTC's investigations. By the way, the FTC is an open secret. The FTC has a big, open, active investigation of Amazon and all of its various conduct um, when it comes to small businesses and um, workers and everything else. So this is not theoretical, by the way. This is why Amazon's doing it. This is not theoretical. The FTC has Amazon in its crosshairs. Now... It's led by a person who knows the company, who actually knows what she's doing. And Amazon's unacceptable. And unacce- we don't like that here. <laughs> absolutely unacceptable. Never, by the way, never once has Amazon or any other any other monopolist said a word about this procession of ex lawyers, soon to be lawyers again who have marched in and out of the FTC and every other regulatory agency in Washington. They don't care about that. They're like, oh, you came from Arnold and Porter? No problem. You're going to go back to Arnold and Porter after you leave here in two years? Cool. Then we are assured that you're not going to do anything in this time to piss off any of your clients. No way. There's no way you're doing that. So we're good. You can hang out all you want. Lena Khan isn't in that club. She's not in the club. You know what I mean? She like lives outside of this world. She doesn't show up to the ABA's spring meeting and, and eats the, eats the cheese, eats, eats off the cheese trays and drinks the champagne. Bro. She's not one of you. All right. That's the news. Anyway, cowardly, uh, behavior. We'll see how it goes. I don't know. I don't know what the result of this is going to be, of course. Um, chances are this will be an effort in vain and Amazon will look stupid. But we'll see what happens. We'll see. I want to talk to Dania, but let's do story time real quick because I want to talk. I want to I got to dunk on Amazon more. I'm having too much fun. Story time. <laughs> Breaking news here on the happy hour. 
It's hot, bro. It's been extraordinarily hot. On both coasts, by the way, I, I, here in middle America, it's been very it's been, it's been very mild. But on both coasts, particularly the West Coast, it's been a scorcher. Uh, not funny, like crazy global warming, by the way, induced uh, high temperatures all throughout the last week. Allegedly. Talking- <laughs> no, stop. National Weather Service was like, uh, these are like. These are temperatures that you would see once every few thousand years, except that now we see them like once every five years. So maybe that's bad. Um, Just a coincidence. Yeah, that's it weird. happens. <laughs> Definitely not our fault. As as big beer billows smoke into the environment. <laughs> beer factories. The beer factories. So it's been hot. And as you may know, um, Amazon has a lot of warehouses on the West Coast, particularly in its own backyard um, of Washington State, where they've really, I mean, that's been the epicenter of this heat wave, 110, 115 degrees, um, hundreds of hundreds of deaths, by the way, all down Cascadia from from, you know, Vancouver, B.C., down through southern Oregon. It's been crazy. I'm going to share. I want to share a little bit about what Amazon says about its employees. Amazon says here, this is from a website, an Amazon website called aboutamazon.com. This is investing in our employees. Nothing I'm reading. Nothing is more important to us. Nothing. than keeping our employees safe. Improving health and safety. Constantly educating employees about new health and safety protocols. Ensuring employee safety through open dialogue. An industry-leading two-way feedback system. Oh, it sounds like they have a union. Is that true? Weird. They don't crazy they don't they just have an hr department so basically the same thing they only kind of have one of those (laughs) now let me show you this story this from the seattle times amazon warehouses in kent remain in operation despite lack of climate control this is from three days ago four days ago In the middle of this heat wave. Uh, Kent, by the way, is a suburb. It's like South South Seattle. It's in between Seattle and Tacoma. At one warehouse in Amazon's complex in Kent, works on Sunday, were handed iced neck scarves. I just can't picture that. You have... (laughs) Neck scarves. I'm just... What I'm are you talking a about? Knit scarf dunked in water, then stuck in like a chest freezer, <laughs> or like it's either that or like um, a bunch of ice packs, kind of like sewn together in a strap. I can't live with this. I mean, I cannot. I can't <laughs> live with this right now. Yeah, did they steal some like Pfizer COVID vaccine freezers and pack them full of of um, woolly scarves? I'm scrolling down here. Heat precautions. Heat precautions were less evident at another of Amazon's Kent facilities. As I said, it's got a bunch right around Seattle. Where interior temperatures neared 90 degrees by midday. Not every workstation had functioning fans. Nah, some did, though. And some departments were running power hours in which workers are asked to move as quickly as they can for an hour to boost productivity. That's also just bananas to start with. I I don't like, do you get, do you just not get fired for moving faster? (laughs) Do you get more money? (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, you know, that bull, that fucking not ridiculed in public that you know, that euphemism is nonsense. This is like, 
we are assuring that all of these workers being beaten down by the heat in the sweatshop warehouse are making their pick rates. That's what that's literally all that is. Here's a quote from a worker. I was sweating immediately. I'm really surprised at how ill prepared they are. Given we have known it would be hot for a little bit now. And then, and then Amazon has the onions, the spokesperson. After that testimony from a worker and this reporter who's clearly like interviewing this worker, probably outside of the warehouse, let's assume, because it's, it's hard to get a hold of Amazon workers any other way. You just got to stand outside the warehouse. You got to talk to them. So you, you can physically see, I mean, I'm sure these workers are walking out looking like devastated. Like they had just been rained on, soaked in sweat. The Amazon spokesperson says, we have systems in place that, can, uh, that constantly measure the temperature in the building and the safety team monitors temperature on every floor individually. We are also making sure that everyone has easy access to water and can take time off if they choose to. Though, although we're finding that many people prefer to be in our buildings because of the AC. Prefer! Is that my cue? <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> All Just right. need to sit All up right. a little more so we can see your shirt. That's the important part. <laughs> <laughs> shirt. All right. Out to loyalty books for this excellent shirt. Let's do. Let's do the intro. Let's do the intro, Danny. That's good. All right. We'll talk. We'll look. We'll talk about getting straight up gaslit by the world's most powerful company. Um. She is, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing, here we go. She is the director of Athena, a coalition including anti-monopolist, labor and workers' rights organizations, racial and environmental justice groups, all fighting to break Amazon's grips on our communities and our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, Dania Rajendra, what's up? Oh, oh yeah! Hello! Thank you for having me. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. I mean, can you even, I can't deal with this. I cannot. I like, it like makes my brain shut down. I get so furious. And it's not, I just picked one story. I don't have to tell you this, but by the way, viewers, I just picked one story. I could have been a dozen. We could make a whole show of like nightmare stories from Amazon warehouses. Facts. How um, does, how does, I got, I have stuff I want to ask you. Okay, ask me. Like, but break, no, I want you to break this down for us. How does Amazon get away with the, I mean, this is abuse. It is a straight up 100% abuse. You're going to drag your workers in a once in a, once in a millennia heat wave, drag them into a warehouse, give them frozen scarves. What are you even talking about? Not a thing. Not a thing. OSHA does not recognize frozen scarves. No. It's not. <laughs> Make them work. Half their fans are broken. They're coming out like, that's bad in there. They should have. They're, why were they not prepared for this? And then the spokesperson comes out and says, you know, actually, people are flocking here because of our great air conditioning. How does, how does this company get away with that kind of conduct? Well, um, Amazon overall has a reputation amongst journalists and researchers, um, as well as the people who work there, um, people who rely on its platform to reach their customers, which I'm sure you've talked about on this podcast, um, for, uh, I believe the technical term is not giving a fuck. I believe that's a technical term. Yep. That's what um, it says in the, in the manual. Yeah. So, you know, even before this story broke, there was a story last week about like Amazon's approach to HR, especially with the P 
people who make up the workforce and the logistics part of the, you know, like the blue collar folks. So they have this thing that they call hands off the wheel. So it's all automated. So imagine the worst time when you call the airline and you're trying to change your flight and there's a storm and whatever, like that's what it's like to try to talk to Amazon HR. Right. So the thing I want to actually pick up on in that story is where the workers like, shouldn't they have been prepared? Like, we knew there was a heat wave coming. It's been on the news, which is kind of what happened when COVID hit, exactly, right? Like, exactly. not like we didn't know there was a virus that was a problem. There was news out of Asia and then out of Europe, like Italy shut itself down. And um, they're, a, they're a corporation that has operations in those countries. They make things in China. Like, it wasn't hard to get the news. But... Uh, whatever they're prepping for, they're not prepping for, no matter how important whoever it is saying it's so important about how they treat their workforce, it's not actually what's important. Otherwise, they would have prepared for it with something other than like ice scarf. <laughs> scarf. Um, Icy scarf. By the way, I mean, I, I feel like there's no way that's true. That has to be some kind of wild half truth who who wants to bet they just were like oh man like we have some abandoned stock in the warehouse oh <laughs> maybe definitely. these will work yeah yeah they're i like, mean or they're like amazon bandanas from some corporate company retreat where they were like here grab this here it's cold compress some like amazon amazon covid gators that don't work you know yeah so um, there's a couple things to say about Amazon in the public sphere, um, which I think is related to what you were just saying about them coming out swinging about Lena Khan not being the person who, like, she should recuse herself because she knows stuff. Like, one of the things that, um, you know, Ms. Khan has done is, like, shine a flashlight into the black box that they like like to pretend is some fancy mechanism right jeff bezos likes to talk about it's always day one and we're an invention company yeah they're inventing the 19th century it's very complicated you work people extremely hard you charge people crazy fees because you can because they depend on you um that's not in fact all that inventive it's just on the internet so Part of Lena Khan's brilliance is to just be like, this is not, this is not actually all that. There's nothing shiny or glossy about the tech veneer, or maybe there's something shiny and glossy about the veneer of this being a, a, a data company or a, what, you know, like it's a tech company. It's just the same dominance, dom, like, same nonsense that big companies and powerful institutions use to bully smaller ones. That's it. That's not, in fact, like there's, there's a limited number of ways in which people can abuse and bully people. And they just have the whole, they've collected the whole set. That's it. So, um, so one of the things that's really interesting is the way in which they have this kind of incredible media machine, right? Um, it was just prime day. Like, so many news outlets will run stories about what's on sale on Prime Day and like Wirecutter will run like your best deals on Prime Day, right? And there's all these affiliate links. So people make a ton of money on Prime Day. And also it has become a news event that there's a shopping event, like Yippee Skippy. Um, uh, they also have all these relationships with local news outlets, which I'm sure you've talked about the monopolization of local news and Sinclair Media or will someday. But like they're, you know, they disseminate these kind of like news pieces that local news will run um, because, you know, the decimation of local news is a national catastrophe. Right. And so between those two things, that's a lot of intense PR about how great Amazon is. So. There are some things that Amazon can claim credit for. They do employ a lot of people, especially in many places where there are too few other employment options. 
Um, Amazon likes to call that investing in the community. That's actually not an investment in a community. We call those taxes, which Amazon generally doesn't pay. But there is a sort of like sense that Amazon is a functional institution. And I think that that's a big part of why they're suggesting that Lena has to recuse herself or that Attorney General Tish James here in New York, who is suing Amazon um, for the way that they treated workers during COVID and for firing them, all of the blue collar workers, as far as I know, who have been fired are black. Mm-hmm. Um, that before Attorney General James filed her suit, Amazon preemptively sued her, trying to prevent her from suing them, saying like New York couldn't enforce its own worker protection laws, right. um, which a judge uh, tossed in the trash bin where it belongs. But um, it's part of a pattern of like, uh, we we run this show, right? Yeah. And I think you could also tr- trace that to um, the name of that guy who argued Nate Sutton, who possibly perjured himself talking about how they have a policy of not stealing the IP of their third party. Our, our friend Nate Sutton. Yeah. No, so, I mean, look, I mean, like, like all these things you're describing are like, this is like Amazon's, the, the, like this mythology that Amazon cultivates around itself of its essentialness. It is, it is, it is absolutely it like it wants to be like essential to all these various parts of our lives, right? So Amazon loved the pandemic. Loved it. They did. Yeah, it was great. They didn't, it was great for them because they could say, look, look at look how much we are relied upon. Look how essential we are, right? And it, and, and 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 it sold itself. It, like in that way to everybody who would listen to journalists, certainly to journalists, to lawmakers, to everybody. And this, and, and it, it's so interwoven with this, like this, like um, the rest of the like detrimental effects of neoliberal policy in America. It's completely interwoven. So you have real middle-class union manufacturing jobs, right? In places like Baltimore, and uh, and in the Inland Empire in California, other places like that, that because of NAFTA, because of whatever, because of, you know, whatever other policies like contribute to this, they're gone. All those jobs have up and left and they've gone to someplace where the labor is cheaper and the regulations are lighter and all these other things. Who fills in that space? It has become like Amazon. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's like, Amazon's genius. That's that's Mr. Bezos's genius is to sort of like find the um, the rips and the tears in our social and economic fabric and then monetize that misery. Yeah. And it's, so and it's everything it's, from, you know, American corporations moving their operations overseas to ending welfare as we know it to like disinvestment in um, the entire regulatory apparatus to like the entire neoliberal bag of tricks, right? Mm-hmm. And the way in which it relies on racism to suggest that protection, protecting people, providing a safety net is, um, you know, coddling undeserving people, right? In a sort of Reaganomics kind of way. Yeah. Uh, has left communities vulnerable to the rapaciousness of Amazon. And that's what I think we really saw in the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. So one of the ways you look, you know, your job and my job is to not just at like, you know, identify the problems, although it's important to identify the problems. And it's important to, I think it's important to have good analysis. And all of those things, not just about the problem with monopoly power, but about its effects and its outsized effects on communities of color, low income communities and so on all over the country. But it's also our job to talk about solutions. Right. And right. Yeah. Now, and right now. Um, as we talked about in depth last week on the show. If you didn't see it, you can catch it. 
Yeah, never miss Maurice. Never miss Maurice, boy. He's he's the guy. He is absolutely the guy. So, um, but we talked about uh, like in depth last week. These uh, this suite of bills in in the House, in the U.S. House of Representatives, that have now passed out of committee, some by the skin of their teeth, and now we are hoping that they eventually get a debate on the floor of the House and they get a vote and they move on down the legislative process. These are important because these are the, the solutions. And one of the solutions is clearly to break up Amazon and to separate this monopoly platform, this monopoly uh, e-commerce platform from all these other various entities that it owns, including all the warehouses and all the shipping. I guess to leverage this power in one into all these other all these other industries and use the weight of that monopoly power to degrade workers, to underpay people, to have these crazy pick rates, to have these contract drivers that have to pee in bottles on their routes because they don't have time to stop, all these other things, all these other abuses. It's all tied into this monopoly power. I want you to talk a little bit, Dania, about about the role that Athena played in um helping to shape these bills and helping to kind of move them along this process as far as they've gotten so far, how important that was in terms of the, you know, the coalition, the weight and the muscle of the coalition and um, what you expect next. Yeah. So Athena is a super wide ranging coalition. We've got organizations that represent small business people. We've got organizations that represent workers. We've got organizations that represent like anti-monopoly, anti-monopoly geniuses like ILSR. Um, we have um, organizations that represent geniuses in other parts of the policy arenas that Amazon touches, which is most of them. Um, and folks across the country who are organizing in their communities or in their neighborhoods or, um, you know, as we've got uh, Jewish organizations and Muslim organizations and like all the ways that people organize in the ways in which um, racial capitalism is harming them. And, um, and so what our role is to make sure that uh, what politicians call everyday people, which is to say non-millionaires or members of Congress, like normal humans, right, have a voice in the conversation about what's happening so that we don't get the kind of nonsense that you were talking about earlier with this Facebook decision, that real people get to explain, like, I'm an Amazon seller, or I work at Amazon, or Amazon came into my neighborhood and now our air pollution is so much worse, whatever, however Amazon is harming them, that we're bringing those folks together and connecting them with the people who are telling the stories about the corporation so that um, instead of a conversation about like, Amazon doesn't like Lena Khan and Lena Khan doesn't like Amazon, what we're actually having a conversation is, Amazon is trying to tell the people whom we elect to govern this society, how to do their jobs. And that's what that's, I think, you know, that's what that story is about. That yeah. story is like, oh no, you can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. And that's what this fight is over these bills and, and the Senate companion bills that we expect. It's like, no, well, actually who's in charge? Like, do we run this entire phenomenon that is the United States of America just to give Jeff Bezos's yacht an extra yacht or do we yeah. like run it so that people in the United States have need to thrive I'll, and, I'll, um, I'll say I'll, we are, go ahead. I'll say this real quickly because I think it's yeah, absolutely so true I mean and it's it is you know like you experience that all the time and and it's like I noticed during the debates, uh, you know, during the markup kind of process of, of these bills, which went on for like 36 hours, it was wild marathon. And but you could you could see over and over and over again, there was this clear tech talking point that came up over and over and over again from these like tech friendly and pro corporate like lawmakers, both Republicans and Democrats, by the way, about Microsoft. 
How did Microsoft, the, you know, there was this like conspiracy theory that was suddenly born and bred and, and like passed around during this markup that Microsoft was somehow yeah, from behind. That guy from Wisconsin. Yeah. Was somehow no, behind. I love Wisconsin. I love you, Wisconsin. Yeah, it's Wisconsin's great. Wisconsin's great. Milwaukee's a real town. I love Milwaukee so much. But, but it, but it, the purpose of that, and it, and it did, and like it caught on. And suddenly, like, supporters of these bills are having to defend themselves against this literal fiction, nonsense. Because all they want to do is take the power away from the people, right? And they want to frame it as, oh, this is just, this is like a big tech civil war, and Microsoft just wants to, like, take down these tech companies. And they want to remove it from the power of the people and they want to make it this fight that no one's going to care about because no one cares no one cares about any of these companies anyway, yeah when we I, launched I so athena, when we launched athena we got a bunch of questions from like the media and whomever and a question that i was not so i come out of the labor movement and out of community organizing and anti-racist organizing. like a question that i was totally unprepared for as the inaugural director is like are you getting oracle money and i was like <laughs> right. i work out of my apartment like <laughs> do i get org like what no like oh are you is is does target is this really like walmart and target funding you and i was like D don't you think that i would have a better haircut yeah. if target was like i i have a tostino's party pizza in my freezer right now <laughs> do you think that's how i'd be living with walmart money bro <laughs> like, like the, the, some people just could not fathom that actually like my so i live in queens home of the place formerly designated as hq2 and like really you could people just could not fathom that people who lived in housing projects could connect that amazon coming to town was clearly terrible even though like we who live in Brooklyn have, I mean, we who live in Queens have been to Brooklyn and we know that all our friends who used to live in Brooklyn cannot afford to live in Brooklyn anymore because gentrification and displacement is a real thing. Yep. And like, similarly, we know that when big corporations come to town and suck up all the subsidies or suck up all the resources, or as they're doing outside of Chicago, suck up all the actual water. Um, like that's not good for the people who live there, but even in the coverage of the beginning of the fight over Amazon coming to Queens, it was like folks could not, um, um, like the reporters, but not just the reporters, like the the people in the city council and the aides to the city council people and the certainly our nefarious governor and the people who work in New York state government, like could not really understand what was happening, which is that like, actually everyday people are the experts on our own lives mm. and we do in fact know what it is we want and you can see that in the polling taking on um not just big tech but big business overall but certainly big tech is popular with people like across the entirety of the bananas american political spectrum yeah that's right that's right. And I think, look, I mean, this is like, you know, the thing you're talking about right here is the like absolute foundation of this anti-monopoly movement. This is like a, this is a realization that one, the people who live in communities like actually know what they want to have in their communities and they know what they want their communities to be about. And they and they and they and they understand the fabric of the communities. And so what it means to have to like you know, like not have some big outsized corporate presence to have local business, to have, to have like local wealth, wealth stay in the community and all things have good jobs, all those things. The realization there. And then this, and then this, like the other side of that coin, which is the realization that there is this like outsized corporate power and outsized concentration that's trying to take this away and has been taking this away, successfully taking this away, taking this power away from communities and away from the people for a really long time. I mean, you're just describing this exact kind of cauldron of things that has that has really given rise to this, um, you know, this current now far more powerful anti-monopoly movement. Yeah. And I would just say, like, we really saw that in many ways. Um, 
you know, of course, there were these amazingly courageous workers across the United States who walked out in the first flush of COVID because what was happening in Amazon was unsafe. I mean, maybe it's because they didn't get scarves dipped in ice or whatever, but probably it was because they were concerned that Amazon was totally willing to let them get COVID, which um, seemed to be eventually what happened. And like, back to your question, Ron, about how does Amazon get away with this? Um in France, at the beginning of the COVID epidemic, Amazon said some stuff about how they were only shipping essential items. And the workers who were actually doing the work were like, uh, this stuff is not essential. In the United States, you might have seen people on late night TV talking about the dildos. Apparently, Americans ordered a lot of sex toys in the, during in, the pandemic. In the pandemic, like, you betcha. You betcha. No doubt. <laughs> and like, I am not here to yuck anybody's yum. I am here to say that like i think it's important to focus on what we're asking people to risk their lives to do because the pandemic's not over so just gonna put that out there but in any case right like in france the workers called up their government and were like amazon is saying they're only shipping essential items and here's some non-essential stuff we're shipping and the french courts were like hey wait a minute hello the workers say you're lying we have done some investigating you are lying fix it that's not what happens in the United States right now. So I think this is also to Katie's point about who are the judges and what kind of pressure and political environment are people making these kinds of decisions in. And it's our responsibility as movement folks um, to create the um, common sense understandings that permeate all of these institutions that of course, when working people talk about what they're doing at work or what their lives are like, we believe them instead of, um, you know, even at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were um, creating opportunities for working people who worked at Amazon to talk about the dangers that they face going to work. Um, originally, the position was like, oh, these folks are lying. Right. And then we saw that again in the fight in Bessemer where Amazon's own PR people were like, you don't really believe us, believe that thing about peeing in the bottles. And then there were Twitter was like flooded. Just got blown there's up. Pee bottles. Just got blown up. There was like, and then the news story came out five minutes later that was like, evidence work that these drivers have to pee in bottles. You know. Yeah. And so I think that actually the tolerance that the public has and that the media has, and even the, in particular, the business and tech media has for the, the um, total and utter garbage um, or the, you know, corporate spin is lessening, but you still see it. You oh, yeah. like in the middle of the fight over those bills, there were all those headlines like, oh, 13 coalitions oppose these big tech bills. And it's like one white dude wandering around like with 13 mailing addresses 13 being like, I'm big tech one, I'm big tech two, like yeah. the chamber of progress, the progress of chamber. Like, <laughs> was like, yeah, like buddy. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, there's no, <laughs> all of this, like, there's like literally no grassroots support for big tech. There's, there's a f absolute, absolute fiction, just astroturfing, absolute and, fiction. And it's not just big tech. Like we're, fo of course, we're focused on Amazon and we're focused on Amazon because we think that they are the exemplar of everything that's wrong in tech and also beyond tech. Like we think it's, it's, it's what's wrong in pharma. We think it's what's wrong in ag. Like this kind of consolidation, the, um, the enormous pile of gold coins that they sit on that allows them to just move into new businesses and like screw them up or like disrupt them or whatever, and then bounce. Um, other tech corporations are, are providing returns for their venture capitalists on like total grift and nonsense. Like Elon Musk talking nonsense about self-driving cars like means that a ton of speculative capitalists get more money when in fact what we have are these like little amazon robots on sidewalks that are bumping into people and a danger right <laughs> like, right it's just um there's a part of this economy that is just 
made up so that there's this return on investment because fundamentally there's a real crisis around profitability. And so you see that real, that push on throughput and on grift. Oh yeah. That feels very similar to the Gilded Age. Or the I, I was going to literally just about to say that you mentioned earlier, how Amazon is this like classic 19th century company. It's also this classic 19th century company in the way that like it can afford to, uh, engage in predatory pricing and expand in all these different in all these different areas um, of of like of industry that it's not it's, you know it's not already in because it has all of this massive Wall Street capital behind it all this investment capital it never has to break a profit it was it wasn't profitable for the first like fifteen years of its existence right I mean like it never has to do that because it's just flooded with all this money because investors are just gonna fucking bet on monopoly power every single time they can unless there's like forced um you know forced innovation forced competition and that only happens to the regulatory process it's the only way that goes right i mean i think the really hopeful thing about it and the hopeful thing about watching all um 36 hours of our lawmakers <laughs> talking to one another in markup is like these problems are the result of political choices and politics is fundamentally something that we can work to control or at least influence and that um you know our democracy was pretty broken before it's even more broken now it's especially broken today thanks supreme court um and like we have some real opportunities right now and there are some real dangers i would say like it's not just that this is sort of like what if Ulysses S. Grant was president and it's like kind of like that? It's all. Oh, Dania, my friend, we lost you. Oh, no, we lost the feed. Tragic. It is tragic. No, I just. Oh. Homie, Dania, you back? Oh, I think we lost the feed. Am I back? You're back. You're back. We lost you for a second. We lost the feed and you were you were on a roll. You were cooking. You were talking about Ulysses Grant. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, you know, they took off drunk history, so I'm just doing my part. I love, <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's like when the U.S. like. I don't think I don't think this internet connection is going oh, no. to it's going to let us continue this conversation. I just don't think so. Well, I I just spent the last like ten minutes looking for. Oh, oh. Hey, Daniel, you there? You there, my friend? Can you hear me? I can hear you. That yeah, the connection's right. betraying us sadly. I'm devastated, but yeah. Yeah, we need public broadband. We need, we do. We need public broadband. Exactly right. We need it. We need it fast, maximum speeds. Um. Well, what I was gonna say is that all this mess was based on colonialism and slavery, and then Jim Crow, and it still is. And so, the incredible danger. There's like incredible dangers, but incredible opportunities right now. And um, this is the moment for popular power to take back our government for the people instead of for the mouths. Yo, I agree with that completely. That, that is the absolute sentiment. And you're exactly right. Look, I mean, this like, you know, colonialism just bleeds straight into industrial capitalism. And it's all about exploitation. Um, it's all about wealth for the very, very few and nothing for, the, for everybody else. And um, that's what we're experiencing right now. And I think you're exactly right. We have this moment in time. We have this political moment where we can take back power and we can, uh, and we can help to you know, democratize the economy and hopefully, and hopefully do it with the interests of the most exploited communities in America to black and brown communities at the forefront of our minds and at the forefront of that policy, because that's what needs to happen. Yeah. And so I just say, I think you have Smiley upcoming. Yeah. Right? The homie. Like she, no one speaks better about economic democracy, but this is why we have to pair economic democracy and political democracy. Cause we can't, there's, there's not one without the other. 
And right now, right now, I'm very concerned about the tattered remnants of our political democracy and economic democracy is part of how we stitch that to be- together and make it function for everyone, hopefully for the first time. Absolutely. Bravo. Bravo. All right. Daniel Register, she is the director of the Athena Coalition, a coalition dedicated to fighting the monopoly power of Amazon. Thank you so much for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure. You're a comrade. You're the homie. I hope you stay in the anti-monopoly movement for a very, very long time because it's so nice. It's such an absolute pleasure to have you here and to work with you. So thank you, my friend. Thanks for joining us. All right. Katie, thank you very much. Nice to have you back. It was a pleasure. Two weeks in a row. I love it. Let's do it again. Let's, Let's keep it going. I like it. I like it. Good vibes on the show. All right. Thank you, everybody. This has been Anti-Monopoly Happy Hour. I'm Ron Knox. You can find us on Twitter, Anti-Monopoly HH. HH stands for Happy Hour. You can also find me personally at Ron M. Knox on Twitter. Next week, we'll be on with Erica Smiley. She is the executive director of Jobs with Justice. It's going to be amazing. You got to tune in. Until then, stay strong. Fight the power. Do not let our corporate overlords get you down. Stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Adios.